I've been asked to address um, the question of bank separation, why, how, state of play, what's next, and can it happen again? And we know what we mean by it. Um, before we start answering this question, I think we should start from square one. And square one is why are we asking this question? Why is there a case for separating banks? In order to answer that question, I feel that we have to go back to basics, which is, what is money? I know Richard Werner will speak about it, and he's a much better expert than I am about it, but I will say in a very simple sentence the very fundamental reason why we're asking this question. Banks create money, loans make deposits, and that has many implications through which I'm gonna go now. Uh, as banks create money, there is potentially an unlimited amount of credit money out there. Okay, that's a fact. I mean, this, there's nothing emotional about this. This is just a fact. Now, the question about asset bubbles and what we do with money is all about, okay, what do we do with that potentially unlimited stock of money? There's three possible uses of that money. One is financing economic activity, going to productive use, okay? And that, when we think about it, has no, in theory, I know there's many environmental issues behind that, but you know, I cannot deal with everything at one time. Potentially, economic activity, human activity, is unlimited. So if you have unlimited credit money going to potentially unlimited human social activity, well, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it can make sense. Second use of, of, of that money is financing assets. And now we have two types of assets. We have assets of which we have a limited stock. That can be real estate, that can be shares, that can be what's, bonds. We have a limited stock of all those financial assets, and there are many other uh, or financial or real assets, but assets. And when we think about it, if you have an unlimited amount of money going to finance a limited stock of assets, well, that's the recipe for creating bubbles. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty obvious when we think about it, and it's happened many times over and over again in history, and there's no reason why it shouldn't happen again. The third type of assets is, it's also assets, but it, there's an unlimited amount of it out there, that's derivatives. Because derivatives are only contracts that, you know, if you and me decide to exchange the right to buy this microphone for 10 pounds in one minute, well, we've created a derivative. And we cre can create as many of them as we want. So if you have an unlimited amount of money funding, you know, derivatives, what you do is that you don't create a bubble on the derivatives price, but what you do is feed an unlimited expansion of the volume of those derivatives. So, you know, the, the, the variable of adjustment there is not the price of the derivative, it's the amount of derivatives outstanding. Just, we have to bear in mind that the notional amount of derivatives outstanding in the world today is $700 trillion. That's 12 times world GDP. Regardless of how you look at it, I mean, there's no way this is about hedging real economy risk and we all know what that means. So that's, that's really the case for separating banks. Why? Because until we haven't made a clear distinction between the two main functions of banks, on the one hand, extending loans which create deposits, so the deposits credit function on the one hand, and of course the payment services that go with them, okay, and all the other functions of banks which are about basically asset financing, and there are many forms of it, uh, we will have credit money feeding bubbles or expanding assets like derivatives uh, with, you know, forever. Um, one thing that, and that will lead me into uh, the current debate in the EU, whether in this country or at EU level or in Germany or in France on bank separation. And that's really interesting what's going on. First of all, it's been a big shame that everywhere, and that has been everywhere, the distinction has never been made. Even in the, in the debate, some of us in this room 
including us, tried to do it, but let's face it, we didn't succeed on that. The distinction was never made that you know, there should be a separation between money going to asset purchases and money going to activity. You know, there's been a debate, and there still is debate, which is a good and valid debate about trading as in financial markets and credit, credit slash deposits, okay, which is a, a good, interesting debate, but in our view, it's not sufficient. There should have been a debate on you know, asset purchases on the one hand and financing economic activity on the other hand. There was no such debate, and none of the reports or, or, or legislative proposals on the tables at the moment, whether in Germany, in France, at EU level, or in the UK, make that distinction. It's a big shame. If we forget, so to speak, that distinction anyway, what is the state of play today in, 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 you know, in the European zone on, on bank separation? To make a much longer story short, Vickers in this country, Lee at an EU level, I'm taking a few shortcuts, very similar, same logic, very similar logics, credit, deposits on the one hand, financial market activities on, on, the, on the other side, many, many details, but no time to get into that. Um, a second family of proposals are the French and the German proposals, which have taken a completely different uh, criterion to, to they like to say separate, which is that they will separate non-client facing activity. And when you think about what a bank does, a bank does something with someone. By definition, it's obvious. And that someone, guess what, is called a customer. So saying that you will separate non-client facing activity comes down to saying that you will separate nothing. Because the minute you do something with someone, then it's not separated. Um, we at Finance Watch have been saying that to the French extensively. They didn't like it, but it's a fact. It's now recognized that you know, the French so-called separation bill will probably impact less than 0.5% of banks' activity. Um, we've been saying it to the Germans, uh, which have an even stricter criterion. That means that you know, the effect will be the same. So you really have two families of, of thinking in Europe. Leakin Vickers and, and, and French German. The worrying thing is that now at EU level, the European Commission is saying that, well, by the way, the French and German proposals are not that bad, so they might serve as a model for EU reform, and in other words, translate as non reform. So that's really one thing we're very worried about. The second big topic, if we don't want it to happen again, is to decide once and for all who will take the losses if and when a bank defaults? You know, what's going to happen if a bank defaults? Who will take the losses? Once the equity has been wiped out, who takes the losses? There is no three solutions. There is only two possible solutions, creditors or taxpayers. All politicians everywhere are saying, of course, no more taxpayer paying. I mean, you will not meet one single politician saying, oh, I want the taxpayer to pay. It's impossible to say. Reality behind the rhetoric is that at the moment, we're seeing national states, and here again, uh, France and, and Germany are not particularly brilliant in that respect, lobbying for the interests of the national banking industry. The French have a very concentrated uh, banking system that is, funded, uh, that is funded mainly, I would say, not mainly, but significantly with, um, with debt. I mean, bonds, they issue senior bonds. And of course, the French are lobbying against the fact that senior bonds could take losses. The Germans have a very different structure, and we, and we, we have Thomas, representative of the Sparkassen here, and he's the expert on that. And, um, and what the Germans are, are saying that um, non-systemic banks should be exempted from resolution and recovery. In other words, you know, there shouldn't be a, a regime by which if small and medium-sized banks fail, uh, you know, um, uh, creditors will, will, will take the losses. That's something we you know, were in the Bundestag recently, and we told them that that has far-reaching implications. I don't know if we will agree on that, but we feel this is really bad. And why is it bad? Because if national states take those sort of measures at EU level where the same discussion is happening, there is a resolution directive being discussed at the moment at EU level, at the end of the day, we're going to have a resolution regime, i.e., once again, who will take the losses if a bank defaults, with saying that, oh, creditors should take losses, but 
the exemptions will be covered funding, covered bonds, short-term debt, senior debt, thanks to the French, small and medium-sized banks, thanks to the German, derivatives, and what am I forgetting? Yes, um, short-term derivatives, senior debt, small institutions, and, and covered funding. You know what this means? That means that the actual amount of money that will be able to absorb losses if and when the next crisis happens will not be sufficient to absorb losses precisely, and therefore the taxpayer will have to pay. If we put that in a context where we have not separated money going to activity from money going to asset purchases, which means that effectively I have no idea when, but the next crisis will happen. I'm not a doomsayer. It's just a fact. I mean, you know, causes produce results. I mean, it's, it's just a fact of life. So there will be new crises, and if we have not prepared for creditors to take losses, we know who will take the losses, you know, when, when the crisis comes, and we shouldn't be surprised. And we'll hear politicians again in all countries saying, oh, how is it that it's not working? Well, we know why it's not working. If I'm, do I have still one or two minutes? Two minutes. Um, the last question I'd like to address, I've been asked to address, is the question of size of banks. Um, should there be a hard limit on the size of banks? Um, well, the debate there is, first of all, there's very strong evidence, and there's some very good research on that, that there is no scale, I mean, benefit of scope, benefit of scale, uh, beyond a size of more or less, not an exact size, 100 billion-ish. Whether it's euro, pounds, or, or dollars at the end of the day, as it's not an exact size, it doesn't matter so much. But that sort of size, beyond that, there is no economy of scale or, or scope in, in, in banking. That's, that's, that's one thing. Um, just, you know, let's, let's remember then, if you look at Barclays, if you look at Deutsche Bank, if you look at BNP Paribas, you're talking about the size of banks which is between 20 and 25% bigger than 100 billion. So, you know, it's like, you know, our, our very large banks are 20 or 25 times bigger than, than the amount I just described. So that's one thing. Second point on this is that if we look at the American example and experience, which has a very effective resolution regime, repeating myself, resolution regime means how do you manage banks when they fail? There's about 90 banks' failures in the US every year, okay, for small and medium-sized banks, and they go down well. Of course, by definition, failure is, is never a positive event, but they go down well because they're small or medium-sized banks, and you can manage the default of a small or medium-sized banks without uh, an impact on the taxpayer or depositors. Large banks are extremely difficult to resolve, and the US, US experience has shown us, showed us, sorry, that even at 300 billion-ish size of balance sheet, like in Washington Mutual, it would be even worse for the very large US banks, resolution doesn't work. So there is a very strong case for limiting the size of banks, but here again, we, we're confronted, and we at Finance Watch are confronted every day with that sort of arguments on the ground, certainly at EU level, is that you're not against freedom, are you? You know, what about our freedom of expanding and expanding and expanding all the time? Now, I'm stopping in five seconds, if I can have a last sentence. This is why there is a very strong case for separating banking activities, because if you don't put a hard cap on the actual size, at least we should stop feeding the endless expansion of unproductive banking activity through funding subsidy deriving from the public safety net. Thank you very much.